Hello, and welcome back. I was in the midst of finishing up the ninth video, which is an addendum to the Navier-Stokes problem, when suddenly from out of nowhere the solution to the Goldbach conjecture became clear to me. Since the solution is extremely short, I thought it would be best to temporarily delay finishing the ninth video and rush to finish this one instead. This will be my tenth video, and it will be a compilation of margin proofs that solves the Landau problems. Now what are the Landau problems? At the 1912 International Congress of Mathematicians, Edmund Landau listed four basic problems about prime numbers. He characterized these problems in his speech as being unattackable at the present state of mathematics. Those four unattackable, unsolved problems became known as Landau's problems. They are as follows. The Goldbach Conjecture can every even integer greater than two be written as the sum of two primes? The twin prime conjecture. Are there infinitely many primes P such that P plus two is prime? Lujanger's conjecture. Does there always exist at least one prime between consecutive perfect squares? The near prime conjecture. Are there infinitely many primes p such that p minus 1 is a perfect square? Or alternatively, are there infinitely many primes of the form m squared plus 1? What I discovered was that these four Landau problems are really just four expressions of the same basic concept. All odd integers are squares. Finding solutions to these four problems is based upon three keys. Key number one. We will perform all operations on a number line. Since a number line is infinite, then all operations we perform on this number line will be applicable infinitely. Key number two. Odd primes and odd numbers are equivalent. I know this may sound obvious, almost silly, but trust me, it is not as simple or as obvious as you might think. Key number three. We will rely heavily on our old favorite, the Quickian power rule, where q to the n equals nq, or the power rule of exponents, or de Mavide's formula. Armed with these three keys, we can easily solve Landau's four problems. Let's start with Legendre's conjecture. It is the most fundamental of the four problems. Once we solve this problem, we can very easily solve the other three Landau problems. Legendre's conjecture, proposed by Adrien-Marie Legendre states that there is a prime number between n squared and n plus 1 squared for every positive integer n. We can solve this conjecture very quickly and easily. Let's construct the number line that spans the integers 1 through 10. We next square each integer, and by doing this, we construct the new number line consisting of all perfect squares. Now looking over this new all perfect squares number line, you can see that the difference of consecutive squares is equal to an odd number. In fact, if we perform a series of sequential subtraction of squares, we can produce an odd number number line, which necessarily has to include the primes. And we can confirm this algebraically. Here's a proof of it. We can also confirm this by using a visual geometric proof. Notice how each successive odd L sums together to form ever larger squares. And now you see, even though it sounded a bit crazy when I first mentioned it, every odd integer, including odd prime integers, are actually squares since they are all differences of two perfect squares. And so getting back to our number line, notice that every integer is separated by a gap of 2n, where n equals 1. And again, just as in any standard number line, this has to be the case. Any and every consecutive odd number has to be separated by a gap of two. But notice that in the way we have generated the number lines, each perfect square corresponds to a two n gap. Therefore, the gaps between the odd numbers serve three purposes. It represents a gap of two that must exist between every consecutive odd integer. It represents an even integer, two n, as we progress up the number line. And it must also represent the perfect square that generated it. And so that 2n gap has to represent 2, 2n, and the square, n squared. We can reconcile this equivalency of 2n and its equivalent square by using the Quickian power rule, where q to the n equals nq. So therefore we find that the 2n gap is equivalent to n squared, the perfect square. That is, n squared is equivalent to 2n. 
And to illustrate this, we see that by starting at 1, we may regenerate the original number line without any gaps by replacing each gap with 2n equals n squared. For example, if n equals 1, then the space between 1 and 3 is 2 times 1 equals 2, which is equivalent to 1 squared, which equals 1. If n equals 3, then the new gap between 5 and 7 is 2 times 3 equals 6, which is equivalent to 3 squared, which equals 9. And so we see that by starting with 3, every odd positive integer is bracketed by a set of consecutive perfect squares, n squared and n plus 1 squared, where n is any positive integer. Now using our number line as visual evidence, along with our power rule of exponents, where n squared is equivalent to 2n, starting with 3, it's easy to see that all odds are bracketed by a set of squares in addition to being bracketed by a set of even integers. And so therefore, Legendre's conjecture is true for all odd integers algebraically, but not necessarily operationally. And we will get back to this point shortly. But for right now, we can say we have proven that all odd primes as odd integers will be bracketed by a set of consecutive perfect squares, m squared, and m plus 1 squared, where m is some positive integer. But there's a slight problem. Do you notice the difference? Some positive integer, m, is not any positive integer, n. So somehow, we have to reconcile this difference between some integer and any integer. Now let's go back to that point about Legendre's conjecture being algebraically true for all odd integers, but not necessarily true operationally. Now what exactly did I mean by that? Well so far this has been a Quickian proof and a Quickian interpretation. It has been rigorously derived and is undoubtedly rigorously true. Ironclad as I like to say. But it differs from the conventional interpretation of the conjecture. The Quickian approach uses the power rule of exponents to set its upper and lower boundary limits along an infinite number line. It establishes rules where we can sequentially fill an odd integer number line gaps with perfect squares. Or conversely, we can sequentially fill a perfect square number line gaps with odd integers. But the conventional interpretation of the Legendre conjecture asserts that the gaps between the perfect squares will always be of such a magnitude that there will always exist at least one prime that's never less than the magnitude of the gap but simultaneously will never exceed the magnitude of the gap. In general, it asks is there some prime that is simultaneously greater than n squared and less than n plus 1 squared in magnitude? Is there always some prime that is sandwiched between the two boundary limits? Now the Quickian approach was more intent on the algebraic filling of gaps, but we can still answer the conventional interpretation if we can equate primes and odds. And at first blush this may seem to be too easy, because all odd primes are odds. But again the problem still remains. Not all odds are primes, so we can't really say if this equation is true or not. But remember, we prove that every odd positive integer along this difference of perfect squares number line is and must be a difference of two squares. Therefore, since every positive odd prime is a positive odd integer, then it must be the case that odd primes and odd integers are equivalent since both are and must be the difference of two perfect squares. And so we are algebraically justified in equating both odd primes and odds. And this does indeed give us Legendre's equation for odd primes. However, 2 is also a prime and must also satisfy the conjecture. And we see that if we are given that n equals 1, then the lower limit is 1 and the upper limit is 4. Therefore, 2 as a prime satisfies Legendre's conjecture. And since all our operations were performed along an infinite number line and all the positive integers are infinite, then we know that Legendre's conjecture is infinitely true. There's a prime number between n squared and n plus 1 squared for every positive integer n, where n plus 1 squared is greater than some prime which is greater than n squared. Now since we have proven that odd primes and odds are equivalent, then solving Goldbach's conjecture and the twin prime conjecture becomes super easy. The Goldbach conjecture is one of the oldest mathematical conjectures in all of mathematics. It is stated simply as follows. Every even natural number greater than 2 is the sum of two prime numbers. 
Therefore, we can express this as prime sub one plus prime sub two equals two n, where n is any positive integer greater than one. But we know every even integer must be composed of some two odd integers. But since we have proven that odd integers are equivalent to odd primes, since both are differences of two perfect squares, then we can easily substitute odd prime for odd integer, which gives us Goldbach's equation. Therefore, Goldbach's conjecture is true. Any and every even number greater than two will and must be expressed as the sum of some two prime integers. The twin prime conjecture asserts that there are infinitely many twin primes or pairs of primes that differ by two. Again, this is easily solved. Since any two primes other than two will yield an even number, 2n, and since there must exist some infinitely large integer, then there must also exist an infinitely large even number of the form 2n equals two times infinity. And if Goldbach's conjecture is true, then it must also be true that an infinitely large even number of the form 2n is equal to two times infinity must be composed of two primes, prime sub one and prime sub two, whose sum is also infinitely large. If we allow n to equal one, then we may state that prime sub one plus prime sub two times infinity is equal to infinity times two n. But note that two n equals two is also the gap that must exist between the twin primes. Therefore, there are infinitely many prime pairs that produce infinitely many gaps of two. Therefore, the twin prime conjecture is true. And as a corollary, it is clear that the gap may range from 2 to infinity and that n may range from 1 to infinity. Therefore, there are infinitely many prime pairs that produce infinitely many 2n gaps where n ranges from 1 to infinity. I have saved the near prime conjecture for last. It actually gives us deeper insight into some of the rules of number theory. The near prime conjecture asks, are there infinitely many primes p such that p minus one is a perfect square? Or in other words, are there infinitely many primes of the form m squared plus one? The answer easily follows from solving Legendre's conjecture. Every odd integer is bracketed by an upper and lower perfect square. This perfect square is n squared where n is any positive integer. According to the power rule of exponents and Quick's power rule, this perfect square is equivalent to 2n, where n squared is equivalent to 2n. The upper n squared, which is equivalent to 2n, is always one less than the odd number it precedes. Therefore, every odd prime being equivalent to an odd integer will and must equate to some form of 2m plus 1, where m is some positive integer. Conversely, if 1 is subtracted, then every odd prime being equivalent to an odd integer will always result in some equivalent perfect square m squared where m squared is equivalent to 2m. And if odd primes are infinite and are equivalent to odd integers which are bracketed by n squared equals 2n then there are infinitely many primes of the form 2m plus 1. And since m squared is equivalent to 2m then there are infinitely many primes of the form m squared plus one. Now again, this solution is all fine and true as long as we can substitute prime for odd and odd for prime. But when we were proving Legendre's conjecture, we had to prove that there was no operational distinction between some integer m and any integer n. And this we proved by proving that odd integers and odd primes were equivalent and we have relied heavily upon this fact to prove all of the four Landau problems. In fact, we don't really need the odd prime odd integer equivalency to prove the near prime conjecture. The number line patently establishes the bracketing pattern for M and N alike. But our proof is implying that if M and N are truly equivalent, then the near prime conjecture must take on an entirely new and different interpretation. We have every confidence in our original proof, but what I have found is that with these quickie and margin proofs, there are usually several solutions to the same problem. So let's start again with trying to prove the near prime conjecture. However, this time, let's recast it in the equivalent language of quick. The quickie and near prime conjecture asks, 
Are there infinitely many primes p such that p minus 1 is a perfect square? Or alternatively, are there infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus 1, which is equivalent to 2n plus 1, where n is any integer? Let's review some of the conceptual uneasiness we had when we solved this problem the first time. We say odds and primes are equivalent because both are differences of two perfect squares. And this is undoubtedly true. But is it? How could it possibly be? We know algebraically that the difference of two perfect squares necessarily has to be a square. That is, if you take the difference between two sets of apples, you don't get oranges, you get apples. So if you take the difference of two squares, you have to wind up with a square. The algebra and logic couldn't be any clearer. But on the other hand, that would be impossible for primes, since a prime can only have one and itself as a divisor. A square will always have its square root as a divisor, but there is no integer square root of, say, the i prime 5. So the logic and common sense is telling us one thing, but the algebra is as plain as day and is telling us another. So this battle between logic and numbers need to be resolved. But remember, the algebra always prevails. If the algebra has been conducted properly, it is always correct. So we know the equivalency of primes and i's are true. So what are we missing? Well, what is crystal clear is that algebraically, we can apply the power rule of exponents to these numbered lines, and in so doing, the i's behave just like exponents. And if they behave like exponents, then they have to act as quaternions. Now this shouldn't come as a surprise to you because we proved back in video 6 that all integers are quaternions. And as quaternions, they must all obey all the rules of quaternions pertaining thereto. So since it seems we are dealing with quaternions, let's look into our quaternion toolbox. And what do we find? Euclid's formula. This is precisely the tool that we needed, where m and n are some arbitrary integer. Euclid's formula generates Pythagorean triples when given an arbitrary pair of integers m and n, with m being greater than n being greater than zero. The formula states that for any Pythagorean triple, the sides a, b, and c are integers and may be expressed as a series of squares. And so it must be the case that sides a, b, and c are integer sides of a right triangle. However, all three sides are algebraically expressed as squares. Given the Pythagorean triple, 3, 4, 5, then the hypotenuse, 5, which is a prime, must be expressed as m squared plus n squared, which is a square. So this definitively proves that both integers and integer primes may be squares. This should also erase any doubt that all odd integers are squares. Now a primitive Pythagorean triple is a right triangle where the greatest common denominator of each side is 1. So therefore side A is the difference of two perfect squares and must therefore be an odd integer primitively. Therefore, if A equals m squared minus n squared, then it must be the case that A plus n squared equals m squared. Therefore, side C must be the hypotenuse of a right triangle, and it too must therefore be odd primitively. Therefore, given C equals m squared plus n squared, then it must be the case that C minus n squared equals m squared. We arbitrarily allow A to be any odd prime, and we arbitrarily allow N to be 1, and in so doing, we generate a series of perfect square equations. It is given there are infinitely many primitive Pythagorean triples and infinitely many primes. Therefore, there are infinitely many primes that satisfy these equations. Therefore, the first part of the near prime conjecture is true. There are infinitely many primes p such that p minus 1 is a perfect square. Let's once again consider our number line. Any and every odd integer along this infinite number line may be formed by the addition or subtraction of 1 to form some even integer. Therefore, some odd is equal to 2n plus 1 or some odd is equal to 2n minus 1. Since all primes greater than 2 are odd, then all odd primes satisfy the equations. Some prime is equal to 2m plus 1, and some prime is equal to 2m minus 1, where m is some integer. And since these primes are formed along an infinite number line, then it must be the case that there are infinitely many primes of the form 2m plus 1.
And so we very nicely prove the alternative version of the Landau's near-prime conjecture. This concludes solving the four original Landau problems, but the Quickian near-prime conjecture still remains unanswered. Are there infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus 1, which is equivalent to 2n plus 1? It seeks an answer for 2n plus 1, not 2m plus 1. That is, it seeks a solution for all integers, not some arbitrary integer. If we were to rely upon the equivalency of odd primes to odds, then we could easily substitute m for n and get a valid solution. But again, to double check the accuracy of our proof, let's suppose we cannot apply this equivalency. Let's continue trying to find an alternative route. So we find that every primitive Pythagorean triple is generated from a unique pair of coprime integers m and n, which in this case are the variables of Euclid's formula. Now what does coprime mean? Coprime means that the only common divisor the two integers have is 1. That means 7 and 6 are coprime. Even though 6 is divisible by 2 and 3, 7 is divisible by neither of them. Their only common divisor is 1. We also find that for any primitive Pythagorean triple, integers m and n must be coprime and m must be an even integer. Let's call this condition condition A. It is also given that there are infinitely many primitive Pythagorean triples. Now let's force n to be a constant of 1. This in turn forces m to always be some even integer m equals 2x where x is some integer. But we see that x may be any positive integer in order to satisfy condition A. So that allows us to state that m equals 2n, where in this case, n sub 0 is any positive integer. Here we distinguish n sub 0 as being any positive integer from the Euclidean n that is some arbitrary positive odd integer. Therefore, we can state that a coprime pair is equal to 2n plus 1. And so we form two pivotal equations. m is equal to 2x, which is equal to 2n sub 0, and a coprime pair is equal to 2n sub 0 plus 1. These two equations form the basis of an infinite set of coprime pairs that generate an infinite set of Pythagorean triples. But given Euclid's formula were c equals m squared plus n squared, we see that this coprime pair must be an expression of the Pythagorean theorem. Therefore, m and n are orthogonal. Therefore, m plus n equals 2n sub 0 plus 1. This forms a complex number in the form of a plus bi is equivalent to 1 plus n times 2. In fact, we can now see why we can apply our power rule to the even integers since i is equivalent to negative 1 half, which is equivalent to 2. And now it becomes clear that the L's, or normals, of the geometric proof were actually complex numbers. Therefore, it must be the case that m plus n equals 2n sub 0 plus 1 form a coprime complex number where n sub 0 is any positive integer. Since a complex number may be construed as a single number expressed as two components and a set of coprime integers act as a single prime, that is, they have no common divisor other than one, then it must be the case that a coprime complex integer must be equivalent to a single integer prime. If c equals a plus b, then if c is a prime, then a plus b as a coprime complex number must also be a prime or be equivalent to a prime where c is the hypotenuse of a Pythagorean triple and n sub 0 is any positive integer. But we know that every value of c, which is the hypotenuse in a Pythagorean triple, is not a prime number. For example, in the Pythagorean triple 7, 24, 25, the hypotenuse is the non-prime composite number 25. We also know that c is not and cannot be every odd number, and yet that is precisely what this equation is telling us which brings us back full circle to the concept of the equivalency of primes and odds, which we are trying to avoid. However, it fortunately returns us back to quick. Back in video 6, we introduced the spiraling right triangles. It is also known as the square root spiral and the Pythagorean spiral. These spiraling right triangles were based upon the Babylonian and Egyptian concepts of the Yukulu and the Sikit respectively. But we found in these spiraling right triangles that the Ukulu and the Sikit were also equivalent to trigonometric identities. 
We also introduced the concept of quadrants in video number three. A quadrant is the squared side of a right triangle that may be expressed as either a square measure or a linear measure. For example, three feet by three feet is either three square feet or quadrants of nine linear feet. So if we square all the sides of all the spiraling right triangles, we get a spiral of triples with all sides made of integer quadrants. We will call such a spiral a quickian spiral. Now notice that every triangle is a new type of triple in that all sides are integers, but not of the conventional Euclidean M plus N type. Also notice that the base of each triangle is maintained at a constant value of one. But the most crucial piece of information from all of this is that the hypotenuse of one triangle is simultaneously the height of its contiguous counterpart. Let's phrase that a bit differently. When the base x is held at a constant value of 1, then the height y is always equal to the hypotenuse as the slope, which brings us back to the ukulu and the secret. This is precisely the definition of the derivative of e to the x. That is to say, as we discussed in our first video, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. To prove this, let's plot f of x equals e to the x equals y. Starting at the origin, we extend out along the x-axis an absolute distance of 1, in this case positive 1. We then extend up along the y-axis until it intersects the curve. This point of intersection is the point E. This point of intersection also locates the tangent or slope or derivative. From these x and y components, we can form a right triangle. The hypotenuse of this right triangle is also the slope or tangent or derivative. As long as we maintain a value of 1 in the base of this triangle, we can move this triangle back and forth all along the x-axis. The inclination or slope of the hypotenuse will adjust accordingly, always forming a tangent line to the curve. Also, any height along the y-axis will correspond to some slope or tangent or derivative of the curve at the point of tangency. This makes sense because the height is only being divided by 1, which is the base, to form the slope where the slope is y over x is equal to height over 1. But the height is the y value, which is f of x equals e to the x equals y. And the y value is always the slope or tangent or derivative. And therefore we have f of x equals e to the x equals y, which is equal to the height over 1, which is equal to the height, which is equal to the hypotenuse, which is equal to f of x, which is equal to f prime of x, which is equal to e to the x. This traveling right triangle exactly duplicates one of our spiraling right triangles. It maintains a constant base of 1. The hypotenuse and long side or height of the triangle are always equal. This confluence of sides always expresses the tangent or derivative at that point. But since every height and slope are derivatives, then every height and hypotenuse functioning as slopes must be unique. Therefore, every hypotenuse, which is every slope, which is every integer, acts as a prime in that it is only divisible by 1, the base, and its height, since it can only be a quotient of the height over 1, which is also equal to the height. This yields a unique slope, which yields a unique integer. It is also the case that each height of the spiraling right triangle is coprime. Each height is simultaneously being composed of a coprime pair that consists of an even and an odd side where the two integer sides differ by one. Thus, the definitive equivalency of prime and coprime. Note, however, that in the Quickian spiral, the hypotenuse may be any positive integer. It can be even or odd or a combination of both. Where every odd integer is a difference of two perfect squares, we reconfirm that every integer is indeed a quaternion, where n over 1 equals y over x equals the slope, which equals a quaternion, where n, in this case, is any positive integer. And since there are infinitely many Pythagorean triples, then there are infinitely many sides in a quickian spiral, including the hypotenuses. Therefore, there are infinitely many primes of the form 2n plus 1, where 2n plus 1 must obey Euclid's formula, where the hypotenuse equals m squared plus n squared 
which is equal to size a plus b, which is equal to 2n sub 0 plus 1, which is equal to a prime. Therefore, the Quickian expression of the near prime conjecture is true. There are infinitely many primes p such that p minus 1 is a perfect square, and there are infinitely many primes of the form 2n plus 1. We had to jump through a lot of hoops to get to this point, but just to make sure no one got confused or lost along the way, let's review everything we've learned so far in a series of logical steps. The diagonal rule says that if a right triangle has integer sides a, b, c, then we can say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And Euclid's formula says we can compute all the integer sides of all the Quickian triples or Pythagorean triples. Euclid's formula also says that M and N must be coprime and that one of them must be even and the other one must be odd. And from this we deduce that if the hypotenuse C is prime and at a constant short side of 1, then the hypotenuse C is the hypotenuse of a Pythagorean triple and N sub 0 is any positive integer which seems to be untrue since every right angle hypotenuse is not prime. And if we apply Euclid's formula to the Pythagorean spiral, we get a version of the Quickian spiral where M is some Euclidean integer. With a constant short side of 1, then this is always true. However, this doesn't say that the hypotenuse is always prime or that M is any integer. But it has been established that in the Quickian spiral, the short side is always a constant of 1 and the long side is always even. So in the Quickian spiral, the hypotenuse is always 2n sub 0 plus 1, where n sub 0 is any positive integer. So in the Quickian spiral, we now have the hypotenuse capable of being any odd integer. But that still doesn't explain why any odd hypotenuse is a prime. In the Quickian spiral, every side or hypotenuse is unique because the magnitude of every side is its slope. And in this case, we will focus on the sides functioning as slopes. Now the definition of a prime is an integer that is only divisible by 1 and itself. And in the Quickian spiral, the sides are only being divided by 1. So we satisfy one aspect of the slope being a prime. But that doesn't say the sides can't be divided by some other integer. However, as slope, it must form an ICR of 0 and it achieves this zero state by virtue of its dual nature being both long side and hypotenuse. If the slope is negative, then its conjugate long side is positive, and since they are of the same magnitude, then they cancel each other, leaving zero. That is, since c equals b, then b minus c equals zero. But since these are slopes, they are quaternions, and as quaternions, they function as exponents and the rules of exponents tell us that subtraction is equivalent to division. Therefore, b minus c is equivalent to b divided by c, which is equal to 1, which is equivalent to 0, which equals an ICR, which equals a slope. Also, given Euclid's formula, then the unit base is by definition the conjugate of the hypotenuse, which is equivalent to the long side. If the base and height are positive, then the slope is necessarily negative. The superpositioning of the hypotenuse has a negative slope and the positive long side results in an ICR of net zero. Therefore addition of base and long side also result in an ICR of zero. This is true for every side in the Quickian spiral. So every side is only divisible by one and itself, thereby making it a prime. So now we can finally assert that in the Quickian spiral all hypotenuses are prime. But in the Quickian spiral, since all hypotenuses are odd, then all odds are prime. However, in the Quickian spiral, it is also true that all hypotenuses are either odd or even as counting numbers, where the counting numbers are 1, 2, 3, and so on. So we have to reconcile this ostensible discrepancy. And we can do that by pointing out that every hypotenuse is and must be a coprime pair since every non-unit side is simultaneously the even long side and the odd hypotenuse of a diagonal triple, which reconfirms that since any non-unit long side in the Quickian spiral is coprime, then it can only be divisible by one in itself, making it a prime. Such primes are called Quickian primes, except for the initial diagonal triple, 
Since all sides of both hypotenuse and quick end prime P that obey Euclid's formula, where m squared plus n squared equals the hypotenuse, and since n equals 1, then subtracting 1, the base, from the hypotenuse, m squared plus 1, leaves a long side comprised of a perfect square, m squared, where the prime P minus 1 equals a perfect square. Therefore, the near prime conjecture is true. There are infinitely many primes P, such that P minus 1 is a perfect square or quadrants in the case of the Quickian spiral. Also, there are infinitely many primes of the form 2n plus 1. And since it is true that all odds and primes are equivalent, then Legendre's conjecture and Goldbach's conjecture are true. And if Goldbach's conjecture is true, then the twin prime conjecture is true for an infinitely large, even number. Now so far, we have virtually ignored the fact that 2 is a prime. But as a prime, 2 has to be subject to all the rules of odd integers as being squares and primes. And that means, somehow, 2 must be the difference of two perfect squares. And from this proof, we see that this is indeed the case. In the Quickian number line and the Quickian spiral, there is no distinction between even and odd because both are squares. And as a corollary, since a squared minus b squared is the difference of two squares, then it must be the case that a squared minus b squared must be a square yielding a squared minus b squared equals 2n equals n squared, which confirms and proves the Quickian number line. And so we have proven exhaustively and definitively that all primes, be they odd or even, are equivalent to all odds. This is by virtue of there being the difference of two perfect squares. And this in turn proves exhaustively and definitively that the four Landau problems are true. Now so far in my presentations on Quick, I've proclaimed Euler's formula as being the preeminent equation of calculus. And in doing this, I have shown that in Euler's formula, Euler's constant E is taken by the power of I theta and is precessed about the circumference some distance theta. And that distance traces out an arc length. And that arc length is a quaternion. But we just demonstrated that E can be taken to any arbitrary power, including I theta, through E to the X. And since that is the case, then somehow the function Y equals F of X equals E to the X equals f prime of x, has to also include and incorporate and blend in with Euler's formula, where x would equal i theta. Now in my first quick video, I presented a very simple and elegant margin proof of the Riemann hypothesis. It very simply proved that the entire diameter of a space centroid was i, which equaled negative one-half and was a concatenation of non-trivial zeros. And this yielded the result that when s equals zero, then zeta sub zero equals negative 0.5, which equals i, which equals non-trivial zero. But I didn't offer any explanation of where the space and body centros came from or why they were needed. I used them almost like labels to distinguish the big circle centrode from the smaller circle centrode. There was really no need to state their function. I only needed to state their presence. Now using what we just learned from solving the Landau problems, I will now provide that missing explanation of the centrodes, and in the process I will once again prove the Riemann hypothesis. In fact, here's the new margin proof. Let's quickly explain how this margin proof works. Let's take another look at the graph of e to the x as tangent line and its accompanying right triangle that travels along the curve. That one single point of tangency forms an ICR. And again, you can see why it forms an ICR from this illustration. You can see that a changing tangent defines an ICR, but even more important, the derivative of e to the x is also its inverse, the natural log of x. And as we see, their common point of tangency is a line of reflection that passes through the origin at precisely pi over 4 radians. And so we see that the graph of e to the x and natural log of x form opposing centrodes. Their common points of tangency, or ICR, always forming along this line of reflection that always has a slope of 1. But most importantly, notice that along this tangent line, y equals x. And this is that all-important quickening key to solving the Riemann hypothesis.
Now since the x of e to the x must incorporate the i theta of e to the i theta, then e to the x and e to the i theta are equivalent. That is to say, any expression of e to the i theta can be expressed as e to the x. And since e to the x and e to the i theta are equivalent, then they have to share the same ICR and same tangent line. And by expressing e to the i theta in terms of its opposing centroids, then we do indeed find that at precisely pi over 4 radians in the space centroid, y equals x. And from there, it's an easy matter to show that y equals x equals plus or minus 0.5. And so the illustration of these unit circle centros dictate that when x equals negative 0.5, then s equals 0, where zeta sub 0 equals negative 0.5 equals i equals non-trivial 0. Therefore, when x equals 0.5, which is equivalent to 1 half, which is equivalent to negative 2, then s equals negative 2, where zeta sub negative 2 equals trivial 0. Once again, I have given you another remarkably simple and elegant margin proof of the Riemann hypothesis. We see that the space and body centroids of the Riemann hypothesis are exactly the same as those of e to the x, since it must be the case that e to the i theta will always be equivalent to e to the x. But the new information this alternative proof provides for us is that the line of reflection between e to the x and the natural log of x is also a concatenation of non-trivial zeros. And so we see that this line of reflection between e to the x and the natural log of x is a manifestation of the Quickian prime.